Hi everybody, this is Eri Berry here. This is the first video of my second channel, Eri Berry True Crime. I have wanted to do this for so long. I love watching true crime uh, vloggers on YouTube and I wanted to do it myself. So instead of incorporating it into my current video where I do lots of different vlogs, I wanted to do a channel dedicated purely to true crime. When I decided to do this channel, this particular case was the first thing I thought of. It It's a case that it goes back a long way with me and it's something that I really really want to bring to the public session oh, the sun's come out just now <laughs> sorry if it gets really bright it's because the sun's come out I first heard of this case back in 1998 uh, I was looking through the TV guides uh, because back then we didn't even have channel 5 we just had the four main channels no remote control I was the remote control love you couldn't change it over to ITV could you that was what my mother used to say so I would flick through the uh, the TV guide so I knew exactly what was on, when it was on. I tell my mother, and uh, so therefore I knew when to change the channels. And there was a program on called A Life for a Life: The True Story of Stefan Kishko, and it was pick of the day. So I had a look at it, and it was described as one of Britain's most notorious miscarriages of justice. It told the story of. A man who was convicted of a murder he didn't commit. He served 16 years. And I told my mother that this was on and she sa said, Oh, I remember this case. I remember it now. Yeah, we'll watch that. And, and I saw it and it was it was really, really moving. Um, it focused uh, not so much on the murder of the girl, um, whom I will tell you about in a minute, but the man who was convicted of her murder before he was, uh, you know, before his conviction was quashed. But if we go back a little bit, the, what, what we're going to focus on first of all is um, the events of 1975, specifically the events of between the 5th and the 8th of October 1975. Leslie Susan Molseed was asked by her mother on the 5th of October to go and get some bread from the shop. She was given one pound in cash and off she went with a bag. Leslie was one of four siblings. She had two sisters and a brother and her mother waved her out of the door that day. Her sister called out to her to say, where are you going? Leslie said she was going to the shops and unfortunately that was the last time her family would ever see her. It was a very quiet area where she lived. It was in Rochdale, Greater Manchester. She was She'd been to the shops before, her mother had a rotor about who was next to go and of course it was Leslie, so off Leslie went, nobody had any concerns at all. Leslie was last seen going to a road called Styops Lane. About half an hour to an hour later, her mother, stepfather and sisters were understandably very concerned that she hadn't come home so they all went out to check and they asked people if they'd seen her. Leslie has been described as a very sociable girl. She would talk to people in, in the street so one of her sisters said in a documentary that you could trace her steps by talking to people because she would talk to them. So they asked people if they'd seen her. Nobody had seen her. The police were called and a search of the area came up with nothing. It was a harrowing few days no matter how much anybody searched Leslie couldn't be found and one of her sisters and her mother uh, they had a chat one day in Leslie's room and they had this feeling that unfortunately they wouldn't see Leslie again. It's unlikely that Leslie would have run away she was only 11 years old and she was in quite poor health she had a heart operation when she was very young it left her with some health and developmental issues she normally would just go straight to the shops and straight back um, her bag hadn't been found, her anorak that she was wearing hadn't been found. A few days later, just on the 8th of October 1975, the body of a young girl was found on the nearby moors and sadly that turned out to be Leslie Susan Molseed. She'd been stabbed 12 times and whatever knife had been used was clearly used with a lot of force because one of them went straight into her heart so it was clear that the knife had been stabbed in right up to the hilt. Her body looked like it had been posed, her underwear was on show and tests showed that there was semen on her underwear. Therefore they were looking for a man, a murderer and kidnapper of this poor innocent young girl. No matter what the police did, all the investigations came up with a blank. There were, there were absolutely no leads at all. So what they did was they started to look in the area for anyone who 
might be quite suspicious. And then they found something. A 23-year-old tax clerk called Stefan Kishko had been accused wrongly by, I believe, three girls of indecent exposure. Stefan Kishko was described back then as a simple person in that he most likely had developmental, maybe intellectual learning difficulties. And he was very vulnerable, very trusting. And when the police went to ask him where he was in that three day window of when Leslie went missing, he did tell them where he'd been, but he had nothing to back it up. He also had, uh, it had been revealed at around about the same time, he'd been attending the hospital for testosterone injections because his testicles hadn't descended. Now this treatment triggered sexual feelings for the first time in his life. So he, he had gone out and bought porn magazines. He also had in his car um, some sweets and some girly magazines. So when the police found those, and the fact that he'd been given the testosterone. So of course the police put two and two together and therefore assumed and believed that they had the right man. At the time Stefan was questioned, um, he ha didn't have a right to have a lawyer with him. He was questioned and questioned and questioned. He gave a sample of his semen. The interrogation got so intense for him that he cracked under pressure and confessed to the murder. And the reason he did this was simply so he could be reunited with his mother Charlotte, who was always there by his side. Stefan was very, very close to his mother. He had been so close to her since after the death of his father, where his father collapsed and died in front of him. They were inseparable. Back then, there was no DNA testing. It wasn't compulsory for people who were arrested to give their fingerprints and DNA. Stefan uh, was put on trial and um, his defense team it, it was rumoured, I believe, that his defence team actually believed he was guilty. The only person who really seemed to believe he was innocent was his mother. And even though Stefan retracted his confession, it was too late, damage done. The defence put across a few arguments. One is he hadn't done it, but they were pretty sure he would get convicted. And it is, this was shown in the television show that they actually asked him to plead guilty because then he could probably get a lesser sentence. And they also tried to put it across that if he had done it, it was uh, due to possibly a mental illness brought on by the testosterone. But unfortunately, the jury didn't see it that way. And after hearing about the allegations of indecent exposure, etc., um, etc., et the jury returned a verdict of guilty on a majority 10 to 2. And unfortunately, Stefan was sent down for life. For Leslie's family, they believed justice had been served, they believed the right person was in jail, they hated this man for killing their innocent daughter. And Leslie's father had at one point shouted abuse at Stefan's mother and had said that he would be waiting outside the prison if Stefan were ever to be released. For the next 16 years, whilst the, the family believed that the right person had been sent down, Stefan suffered in prison. He was beaten up several times. He was just punched in the face for no reason. He was subject to uh, verbal abuse because of course he'd been convicted of being a child killer. Prison just broke him. It, 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 it really had a huge effect on him mentally and physically. And his mother, she fought for 16 years to get her son out of prison. She wrote to even the Queen and the Prime Minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher, and most people, most uh, lords and MPs to whom she wrote believed Stefan to have been guilty. There was, however, enough uh, new information found to launch an appeal, but unfortunately that failed. Stefan was actually transferred from his original prison to Wakefield Prison and uh, under Rule 43 meant that he had to be uh, kept under special circumstances because of the nature of his conviction made him a target for people. After only a few years in prison, Stefan actually developed schizophrenia and uh, there were many other health problems along with that. He suffered greatly. It's amazing that he actually survived the 16 years. Many of the mental health professionals at the prison actually believe that uh, Stefan was suffering from delusions of innocence, that he genuinely didn't believe he committed this horrible crime, but they still believed he was guilty. He was then transferred to Grendon Underwood Prison and he was actually offered treatment for sex offenders, but in order to do this, he had to confess uh, to uh, the assault on Leslie, which he refused to do. 
He was then moved back to Wakefield Prison and then on to Ashworth Hospital where he was detained under the Mental Health Act. After trying and failing to persuade many important people of her son's innocence, Charlotte Kisco eventually turned to a company called Justice, a human rights organisation that helps uh, victims of miscarriages of justice. They put her in touch with a solicitor called Campbell Malone and Campbell Malone was able at this point to go through into the case and into the archives of the case and he found a piece of information which was dynamite. It had been suppressed and ignored by the police at the time in 1975. Although DNA testing wasn't something that was carried out back then, the semen found on Leslie's clothing contained sperm heads. Despite the injections that Stefan had, even though he could perform, he could never produce sperm heads. This information would have cleared his name and proved his innocence beyond all reasonable doubt except the police ignored it. Now, when I was watching the documentary um, about this, which is, um, it's called The 30 Year Secret, I really would recommend you watch that. It was said that the police at the, at the time, when this was found out, this was in 1991, that the police who originally had um, assisted in getting Stefan charged were arrested uh, for perverting the course of justice, but because it was so long ago, the charges were actually dropped. The police knew this, and they suppressed it. To me, that says that they didn't care about justice, they didn't care about the truth, they didn't care about getting the right person, what they cared about was a result. I heard somewhere else that they, they actually, their opinion was that th this was a classic case of confirmation bias, where the police believed so wholeheartedly that Stefan was guilty, they ignored everything that contradicted it, not deliberately, but because they were just so convinced of his guilt. Did the police knowingly have an innocent man sent to jail? Hmm, I can't really say, but maybe. Eventually, Stefan's conviction was quashed. He was released in 1991 after serving 16 years. Of course, Stefan and Charlotte and Campbell Malone were overjoyed. Uh, people were so nice to them. They sent him cards. They, he had, um, you know, he, it was broadcast ever so. Everybody knew he was innocent. He was exonerated. He, uh, it, it, everything w was all happy after that. But on the flip side, the family of Leslie. They relive their nightmare all over again. They found out that this man had not committed the murder. And in the documentary I watched, one of Leslie's sisters said it, it, it was like uh, Leslie had been murdered all over again. Stefan said on television that what he wanted to do for the future was to get married, go on holiday and enjoy his life. He didn't get married or go on holiday. He lived for another 18 months and died of a heart attack and his mother died a few months later. Charlotte said to Campbell Malone that she didn't want the public to forget Stefan and what he went through. And I think part of that was the, the TV film, A Life for a Life. It really paints a picture of a miscarriage of justice and we really can't have this happen again. We, it, it, it would give the families of victims false hope the real people are still out there, still able to commit crimes, and it ruins the lives of the people who were wrongly convicted. In 1998, I watched A Life for a Life, and I remember very distinctively uh, when the credits rolled, the voiceover said, her killer has never been brought to justice. Sometimes uh, murderers will go on to offend again and they might end up in prison. They might end up um, being convicted of, a, of another murder, but we may never know that they may have murdered before. Um, they could be connected to crimes that are just shelved because there's no evidence. Um, in the case of Leslie, Stefan was in prison for 16 years and it took another 14 or 15 years for the real killer to be found, arrested and convicted. Manchester police really had to do a lot of groveling and uh, they really needed to show that they were committed to finding the real murderer to Leslie's family. And Leslie's mother didn't believe that she would ever see Leslie's killer convicted, but they said to her, yes, you will. 
they worked for a long time afterwards to find out what happened. Leslie's family took to the streets asking people about whether, you know, if they remember anything from 1975. Bear in mind this was a couple of decades before. Um, it's unknown whether anybody will actually remember. It was also featured on Crime Watch and it went on for so long that I don't believe anybody thought that they would ever find who the killer was. But the police had a bit of a hunch about something. They recalled that the semen had been found on Leslie's underwear, but what they were thinking that possibly some semen could have got onto her on the clothing on her upper half and the the jumper that she was wearing had been taped, so tapings were taken of the clothing. That was the only forensic evidence that survived from the original. So that was brought out and looked at under a microscope and lo and behold there were sperm heads found on the tape. Now because DNA testing is now possible, they found that they could actually use that to get a DNA profile of the killer, but it was difficult. It was a kind of extraction of DNA that had never been done before. They didn't quite know what to do. They, they tested like dummy examples first of all before doing this with the actual tape because the tape would be destroyed in the process. They did successfully find the DNA of Leslie's killer. They ran it through the database hoping to find a match. No match. The DNA was ran through the database every so often just to see if anyone matched up to it and it was ran and ran and ran and then eventually when it was re-ran there was a perfect match. The match was to a 53 year old man called Ronald Castry who was living in Manchester at the time that Leslie was murdered. He was arrested for another sexual assault and since 2001 the police have the right to take the DNA and fingerprints of people they arrest whether or not you're eventually convicted it doesn't matter and that's how Ronald Castry's DNA was put into the database. He was questioned and he denied the murder. Even though the DNA proved that he had actually killed Leslie, they still had to build a case against him. So they went back and found out what had actually happened. Ronald and Beverly Castry lived in Manchester at the time that Leslie was murdered. At the actual time of the murder, Beverly was actually admitted to hospital shortly after giving birth to her son, which wasn't actually Ronald Castry. She had had an affair. He was left to his own devices and some people believe that it was the whole stress of him having to witness his wife give birth to a son, their first child, in their marriage whom he knew not to be his that that may have driven him to murder Leslie. Shortly after Leslie's murder another attempted sexual assault on a young girl actually occurred very close to that area but the police didn't actually put the two together. Mr Castry was a taxi driver and he tried to pick up two young girls. One had ran away, one he successfully did pick up. He had attempted to assault her but she managed to get away. He was convicted of indecent assault and his sentence, now this has made me extremely angry, his sentence was £25. That is just a little over £200 in today's money. Imagine that happening. You know, somebody is uh, caught and convicted of, uh, even attempted, whatever, kidnapping a child, and they just have to pay a couple hundred quid, slap on the wrist, and they let go. No, that, that has made me very, very angry. Castry's wife and his children were also subject to violence in the relationship. He was an alcoholic, he was verbally abusive, um, he had very strange sexual appetites and his children and his wife cottoned on to him being interested in young girls and wanting his wife at one point to dress up in a schoolgirl's uniform. Beverly and her children had absolutely no idea as to uh, what Ronald had done to Leslie and even though she stayed with him after he was convicted this was partly because his parents had convinced her that it was just a one-off it was uh, something that he was stressed about he was seeking help for she stayed with him but then eventually they did separate in retrospect she noticed that he developed a kind of paranoia where he he would jump in the middle of the night and believe that he would you know he'd be found out for something and when she'd question him 
he 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 wouldn't say anything he, he was very very shady and very seemed to be very secretive castre was convicted on the 12th of november of 2007 with leslie's murder and he's been sentenced to life in prison although he should spend a minimum of 30 years leslie's family finally finally after 30 years just over 30 years finally had justice for what happened to this poor girl i can't imagine you know what they were going through in all that time because they believed it was closed and put to bed at one point although the matter uh, and this is what one of her sisters said is that yes the killer's been caught and they believe many more with stefan that he was the real killer but it doesn't bring leslie back there's always going to be that void of course there will be but at least he's not a danger to the public anymore this man ruined the lives of three families and that was mentioned in the documentary as well his own family were ruined by his behavior uh, Leslie's family obviously and Stefan's family that concludes this case um, there may be many other things that I probably haven't mentioned in this um, I try and be as thorough as I can without going on for too long but yeah this was something that I really wanted to cover because it's not just an awful murder that had happened but a miscarriage of justice and someone evading justice for 30 years before finally getting what they deserved if you want to have a look at this yourself there is a documentary called the 30 years secret and it is in i'll put a link in the description below for that i will be doing more uh, on of these videos for you in the future i'm hoping to possibly get one done a week maybe uh, i do have a special place in my heart for miscarriages of justice because i believe that um it, you know it's one thing to commit a crime that's bad enough but for a guilty person to see an innocent person go down for something they didn't do that makes me particularly driven to help promote truth and justice please subscribe so you can see more videos like this coming up in the future and you've got any suggestions for cases please let me know and um, i'll do my best to cover them i may not be able to cover all of them and uh, thank you very much for watching bye